Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third and final installment of our webinar series with Intertech Alchemy. My name is Jonathan Lackey, and on behalf of the Safe Quality Food Institute, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, How to Stress Test Your SQF Risk Mitigation Plan and Assessment. Again, a little bit, a brief bit of housekeeping. All lines will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the webinar, but we do want to hear from you. So please post your questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can during the Q&A. In addition, please take note of our antitrust statement, which has been provided to you. Conversations regarding price fixing, boycotting, trade restrictions, or other violations of antitrust law are to be avoided. If you believe that the conversation is in violation of the antitrust law, please speak up and we will do the same. As we conclude this webinar series, for more insights on this important topic, we would like to draw your attention to the SQF Risk Mitigation Series we developed in conjunction with Intertech Alchemy. Delivered on their Zosi platform, this online self-paced seven course bundle drives into the critical control points, drives into critical food safety areas and best practices, and there is a free risk exam included. Our North America SQF Focus Day is coming up next week, September 13th. The theme for this virtual event is Recall Readiness and Prevention, with speakers from Costco, McDonald's, Intertech Alchemy, and more. Look forward to seeing you there. Also, mark your calendars. SQF Unites is coming to New Orleans March 11th through 14th. We're actively working on the agenda for the event, and registration will be open next month. We're looking forward to seeing everyone there. With that, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers, Laura Dunn-Nelson and Jeff Chilton with Intertech Alchemy. As the Vice President of Food Safety and Sustainability for Alchemy, Laura has over 35 years of experience implementing food safety and quality control programs for processing, packaging, food service, and retail operations. Jeff is a registered SQF consultant and Vice President of Consulting for Alchemy. With over 30 years of experience in the food industry, specializing in food safety, quality assurance, and plant management. Now that you've gotten to know Laura and Jeff, I'll turn it over to them. Take it away, guys. Okay, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's always a pleasure to be working with you and Laura again. And welcome everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for our webinar today as well. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at what we'd like to cover with our uh, agenda today. And Let's see, just one second. Zach, I'm not getting the slide advance. If you could move us to the next screen, please. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we got a lot of information to cover. It's going to be a fast-paced day, so buckle your seatbelts and get ready. We're going to get started. I'm going to share the first two sections with you and talk about getting started itself and what do we want to talk about in terms of risk and stress testing those systems along with the uh, best practices that we can have for that as well. Laura's skin going to be sharing some information about how do you actually try to break your system and see if it's actually working effectively or not and can you break it? And then if so, then how do you fix the vulnerabilities that you've addressed within that system? And then last, I'll be sharing some information with you about using the data, which is so important to be able to manage our food safety and quality systems, and also the benefits of having an outside set of eyes. Take a look at your systems to be able to add value as well. And then last, but certainly not least, we'll definitely leave time for your questions and happy to answer those for you as well. So please feel free to submit those through the chat as we go through the presentation with us today as we go through this. Okay, and next slide. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started and we'll jump right to the next slide. Let's go ahead and talk about sources of risk. And I hope you've been able to join us for our two previous webinars related to risk around food safety culture and risk around the supply chain. There was a lot of great information in that. And if you weren't able to join us, I'd encourage you to go back and take a look at those webinars as they're available on demand as well. 
Uh, but briefly, just to touch on again, let's talk about where do the risks come from? Because we have to recognize that there are a lot of risks associated with the production of our food products. And then where can those risks come from? And then ultimately, what can we do to be able to control those risks as well? So when you think about sources of risk, and let's start with your product types, you know, some of these are actually inherent to the nature of your business and you can't change. So, you know, if you can't change and eliminate the risk, such as an allergen that may be included in a formulation, if you can't design it out, then we have to think about how can we ultimately control and mitigate those inherent risks that are built into the system itself. You know, secondly, our plant locations where you're geographically located could be an issue, uh, even with food safety hazards related to radiological hazards or your water supply as well. And the infrastructure, you know, is always a challenge for many plants in the food industry. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, some of the plants are older and they have a few challenges in terms of floors and walls and ceilings and doors. So, if you're working in a facility that is older and does have some challenges in those areas, then we're going to have to take some additional steps to be able to mitigate that and to be able to control those as well. And then, of course, we always have to consider our employees, and employees are our greatest asset, but they can also pose a risk to the products that you make. So we have to think about all the ways that we can promote a positive food safety culture to help them understand not only what they need to do, but also why do they need to do it and make sure we're committed to doing things right with a good culture. You know, training plays a critical part for your employees to make sure they have the competency to understand how to perform their work and their duties as well. And then tenure is always a challenge. And as we know, you know, turnover is a big challenge for the food industry itself. And just finding employees to work anymore these days uh, can be a challenge in itself. So especially if you have a low maturity level of the tenure of your employees, you know, that's going to be a critical source to be able to help reinforce their needs and responsibilities as well. Then, of course, we always look at the safety of our products themselves, including the the product types, you know, is it going to be a ready to eat high risk type product? Is it going to be a product that may contain an allergen that's going to require special controls as well? And then looking at our processes, you know, is this an area that we're going to have a low risk area to plant, a high risk area to plant? And how do we separate between the two of those? And how do the employees handle the products as well? So we have to consider those. Beyond that, we have other sources of risk with the supply chains that we've talked about in depth in the webinar that we did, the second webinar in this series as well. So we have to think about our vendors and where are we sourcing those raw materials from, either domestically or internationally, and the types of vendors that we're using and how much depth do we have to that supply chain system, along with our customers. And what are your customer expectations for the safety of your products that you have to make as well? And then, of course, we don't want to overlook the logistics and getting those raw materials to your facility and shipping the finished products away from it as well. And then last, we have to consider sources of risk around food defense and food fraud to make sure that doesn't become a problem for us as well. And then last, not just from a food safety standpoint, we also have to consider the quality of our products as well and quality threats that can occur to the system because equally important to making safe food products, we have to make quality products as well. And those are going to be products that are going to meet your customer expectations and that your customers are going to be happy with and they're going to buy uh, each and every time that they go back to the store to get your products as well and then looking at the complaints. So we have lots of sources of risk that we have to be able to control. So now on the next slide, let's talk about what can we do to actually stress test our systems? And I love this. And, and this is actually built into the SQF code. You're already familiar with some of these requirements and certainly hope that you are. But let's reinforce the importance of these because the SQF code does require you to stress test or challenge your system in a number of different ways. And, you know, first and foremost would be the internal audits that you have to complete that on an annual basis, you do have to do an internal audit of each of the programs that you have, at least annually, to make sure that they're verified and they're validated to be working effectively as well. And we have to do internal audits of our plant inspections, you know, for those open processing areas, at least on a monthly basis, to make sure that we're checking for the GMP compliance and also looking at the infrastructure. Uh, so really encourage you to have a robust internal auditing process because you should be the first one to identify a problem if you have a problem, you know, it shouldn't be a third party auditor having to come in and point this problem out to you. But if you're doing your job well enough and have a great internal audit process, you should be able to define where those problems are and be able to correct those through your internal auditing process. 
And then the SQF code requires us to challenge our systems or stress test these systems for a number of different parts of the code, you know, starting with the product traceability and the recall exercises. And please remember, those are two separate activities. So you need to do traceability exercises of the finished product, but also of the raw materials and of the packaging materials as well to see how quickly can you recover that material and in what period of time and what percent recovery you can have during that also. But you should also do an exercise of your crisis management team. And in the event that you did have to do a recall, what are the steps that you're going to take to be able to execute that recall as well? So that's a great way to stress test your system. Other areas of the SQF code that require these types of tests is the crisis management plan. And this is a great thing to do. I really encourage you to do this. And I'll give you a quick example where we did this with a client that was located in Nashville, Tennessee. And this plant location was not far from the river that runs right behind Opryland in that area. And we decided to do a uh, crisis management plan test regarding a flood scenario. Um, and Believe it or not, the very next year, a 500-year flood did occur in Nashville and did actually flood this client's plant location as well. But, you know, just through the exercise that we had gone through and the planning from our SQF crisis management plan test the year prior, they were able to execute that much more effectively and to be able to mitigate the damage that occurred as a result of this. So when you're thinking about all of these systems, what I'd really love you to think about is, you know, don't just choose the easy test that, you know, you can check the barks and, and be able to hand that to the auditor and say, yes, we did this. Think about what will really challenge your system and what will benefit your operation the most as well uh, to be able to make sure that you learn from these experiences as you go through the stress test as well. And then food defense plans also require a challenge each and every year. So you have to think about how are you going to do that from sending in a truck without a seal or, you know, potentially sending an unauthorized person into your plant to see how far they can actually get <laughs> or leaving doors open. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, but you want to challenge yourself in that area as well. And this next one, I really love because it's a third party audit, but it's a continuous improvement audit itself. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how well this worked for some companies, because I got a call from a corporate director of quality assurance for a company that had five different manufacturing plants in the U S and Canada, both. And I hate to use a bad word, but this plant was actually certified to BRC, not SQF. Um, but the gentleman told me on the phone, he said, look, I just know we're not really as good as what these BRC audit scores reflect. And I really want to know what's going on in my plant. And can you come in and do a third party audit just for my continuous improvement? And it was a wonderful process for that company to go through that really helped them identify where they could improve their food safety and quality management system, you know, without the potential of having to share that report with customers and have it become public information as well. So sometimes you want to stress test your system with a third party audit just for your own continuous improvement. And then, of course, we have the great SQF system that helps verify the efficacy of your SQF systems and food safety and quality management systems on an annual basis as well. So these are all great ways to be able to stress test your systems. And we wanna make sure that we have good robust programs in place to be able to do that. And then on to the next slide. As part of this, you know, always make sure that you take a look at your results, you know, and so the saying goes, you know, history has a, a chance or likelihood to repeat itself if you don't learn from it as well. So you want to look at the records that you've had from previous years. How many times have you had nonconformities and had to take corrective actions and for what types of issues as well? Look also at your previous SQF audits and how many nonconformances have been identified. And most importantly, not just was it a nonconformance next year, but audit and test that same area this year to make sure that the corrective actions that you actually implemented last year are indeed effective and have continued to control that potential nonconformity in your operation as well. So that's a great way to learn and recheck your system as well. And then look for regulatory audits that if you have audits by FDA, by USDA or other regulatory bodies, even OSHA and EPA, take a look at some of those audits and make sure that you've addressed those properly as well. And then I mentioned the mock recall and the traceability exercises. Again, that's not just a finished product, but that should be a package of material, raw material as well. 
and think about what are your standards? What's going to be acceptable for you? You know, a typical industry standard may be a 98% plus recovery within a four hour period of time, but there are certain customers that have tighter standards than that. And then define what you want your own company standard to be and make sure you can execute that. And if you fail to do it, then go ahead and repeat that process consecutively until you get to acceptable results through that process as well. But always look at where you're coming from to make sure that we're continue headed in the right direction as well. And then on the next slide, we'll also take into consideration recent changes. Remember that things change rapidly in the food industry. We all know that where you're introducing new raw materials or new finished products or new suppliers of those raw materials. Other times you could be introducing new equipment and machinery, new production lines or replacing a piece of equipment. You know, all those would be four calls and reasons to do a reanalysis of your food safety plan and make sure that you keep your SQF systems up to date as well. And then if you go through any kind of period of new construction, you want to consider that. Make sure that during periods of new construction that you expand your environmental monitoring program. So you do a more robust environmental monitoring to make sure you're testing more sites and for more things to make sure that you're not disrupting any bacteria that may be in the environment that could cross-contaminate to other areas of your plan as well. And then also take into consideration any new distribution uh, methods that you may be using along with your new employees. Make sure you have a good onboarding program for those employees themselves. And then effectively, how are you training the employees to make sure that they are receiving the training and that they understand the training that they need to go through as well. And then on the next slide, we're going to talk about some best practices. And I'm going to blow your mind a little bit here. And I'm going to ask you not to hate me uh, already in advance when I go through this section here, because I'm going to suggest that you have a new type of written program, and that's going to be an enterprise risk assessment and mitigation program. And I promise you, if you keep an open mind and you think about this and you learn from it and you apply it, you would come back to thank me later. But this is a whole new way to look at risk because it's not a specific risk assessment such as a hazard analysis in a food safety plan or one of the specific risk assessments that's required by the SQF code in a number of different topics as well. But to do an enterprise risk assessment and mitigation plan, it's really a very comprehensive risk assessment that looks at the entire company itself, not just a specific product or a specific process, but you're looking at all the risk based on the company itself in terms of where you located, what types of products do you make, you know, looking at those product risks, which ones contain allergens, which ones may be ready to eat, non-ready to eat, high risk versus low risk type products as well. You know, looking at the facility and the infrastructure risk, Again, if you're in an older facility, you know, that presents a much higher risk and a higher likelihood of contamination as well. And then it also looks at all aspects of your food safety and quality management system. So that would include your recall plants, your pathogen contamination, preventing foreign material, which continues to be a big issue for our industry. I saw another recall yesterday uh, that just came out from a major company related to foreign material as well. And looking at those records, and, you know, you could even include your occupational health and safety, workplace safety risk as part of this process as well, because a lot of these same processes are very similar, whether it's a food safety perspective or a workplace safety perspective as well. And then we want to look at our regulatory risk also. So let me share a little bit more about this process as we go through these next few slides as well. So what is an enterprise risk assessment? It's really a process to help protect your brands and to be able to protect your company. So we're really looking at your overall company and the risk of your organization's capital and your earnings. So think about it from a financial standpoint. And unfortunately, you know, we've all seen and heard the horror stories of literally multi-billion dollar companies that have been put out of business in a matter of months due to a product recall that had the scope expanded from a particular lot to all of a sudden, multiple lots to, you know, a month or a quarter or a year's worth of product. And then they're out of business almost overnight uh, as a result of ineffectively controlling a food safety risk that could have resulted in a product recall or foodborne illness outbreak as well. So this enterprise risk assessment is really talking about protecting your company and your brands as well from some of these catastrophic failures that we've talked about. 
And it's really an enterprise wide. So it's not specific to a plant. We look at each of the plants as part of this process as well. But if you have multi sites and if you have a corporate office, you're taking all of that into consideration. As you look at this process, it's also executed by senior level experts, both internally and externally in each of their functional fields. So certainly QA and operations are involved in part of that process, but you may have other resources that are available to you as well, your legal resources, public relations resources, others that you would bring in in addition to the third parties to bring in expertise in those areas as well to really take a high level look at it as well. But ultimately, it's just a, a strategic approach where you look at the risk in the whole company, not just a particular area, but the whole company itself. And then ultimately, what you're getting to is the bottom line of a tactical process where you identify those areas of the greatest risk, and then you can apply the mitigation measures to those as well. And I'll share some more information on this as we continue to go along and share a few more slides here. So on the next slide, when you think about what type of risk, if you think, you know, what are you really talking about here? You know, we're talking about those types of risks that can potentially lead to product recalls, that can lead to regulatory noncompliances, and that can lead to pathogen contamination or foodborne illness as well. And many times these risks will actually overlap these three areas. They have the potential to cause risk in all three of these areas. So we have to take that into consideration as well, or the individual areas. But you don't want to just look at it from a silo standpoint, but look at those total comprehensive risks throughout the organization as well. And then on the next slide, it talks about where do these risks come from? And I've already talked about this a little bit, so I'll continue to go pretty quick for you. But from a company standpoint, we're looking at that. You know, what are the inherent product risks? Are they low risk or high risk products, ready to eat products, not ready to eat products? What are the regulatory standards? Does USDA or other sites have performance standards for the types of products that you make, like zero listeria or salmonella performance standards that you have to meet as well? And to look at the process risk, you know, do we have those low and high risk areas in your plant and how do we control that? Um, and the geographic locations, like we talked about, you know, just where is your company located? If you're downwind from a nuclear power plant, you may have a radiological risk. If you're in Michigan, you may have a water risk from the, the well water that you may be on and other types of locations. So you have to take that into consideration also. If you do have a corporate office, you know, think about the corporate and the boilerplate programs, you know, whether they're having an SQF corporate audit to be able to audit those programs, and then those are given to a plant at a plant level to make sure they're customized is one option, but you really want to make sure that those programs are going to be fully customized to each specific plant location where that's going to be implemented as well. And this is a great time to get your senior leadership to buy into this process, not only to sponsor the process and to provide the resources that you need to, but remember you have an obligation to keep your senior management informed of the risks that they have in their organization. So you really you wanna ask the question, you know, what's keeping you up at night and what keeps that CEO up at night? You know, which ones are you worried about the most in your facility? Is it a listeria contamination in the environment? Is it the chance of an employee not following a GMP compliance one time and then it ended up on social media all over with bad press for your company? But think about that, but keep your senior leadership informed and use this as an opportunity to get the sponsorship and the resources that you so dearly need as well. And then from the programs, we look at those programs to make sure we actually do truly verify and validate those programs to make sure they're working effectively and that they meet our SQF audit and our regulatory expectations as well. And then from a plant standpoint, as we talked about, making sure that we have the proper design, the right process flows to be able to prevent cross-contact of allergens and cross-contamination of pathogens as well. And then ultimately looking at the records, you know, how many times do you have record keeping errors or how many times have you had corrective actions and what type of CAPA processes do we have and do we really manage those processes? So again, it's just a comprehensive evaluation of all of these different areas. And then on the next slide, it really talks about how do we evaluate these risks. Uh, when we do this for our client companies in a way that you could do it as well, 
we've got a very comprehensive spreadsheet and it actually has, you know, 24 different tabs and each tab has a full checklist of dozens of things that we're actually taking a look at. And it, it's a full range of things, you know, all the way from the company risk profile to the supply chain down to the risk of foreign material contamination. And are you ready for a swabathon? You know, if FDA comes in and wants to take a hundred plus swabs from your plant, are you really ready for that? So as we look at these 24 specific areas, when we do this process, or you could certainly do the same thing internally as well, then looking at that and identifying the risk and then applying, you know, a common risk assessment methodology, as you see on this slide, where we're assigning a rating for severity and likelihood on a scale of one to five for each. And in this case, the higher number indicates a higher risk, but we indicate, you know, which ones are going to be high, which ones are going to be moderate, and which ones are low. And that way we can focus our attention and our resources on the area of the higher risk. And then on the next slide from there, we have a quick poll question for you. So I told you I might blow your mind with this and you probably don't want to have another program to have to manage, but you know, I do think it's a great opportunity. So the poll question is asking you is, does your company have a written enterprise risk assessment and mitigation plan? So if you would take, please take a moment, click one of the buttons and choose one of the answers that you do or no, but you're planning to develop one. You may have just made that decision in the last 10 minutes here. Or no, you don't. And otherwise, you know, what in the world are you talking about here? So please take a moment and answer that. And then we'll see our results uh, pop up here in just a second. And I do apologize about going fast. We do have a lot of content that we're trying to share with you today. So I do want to get through it quickly. But the, the slides and the recordings will all be available to you afterwards to reference back to also. And let's see what the results of the poll come back. And hey, I'm proud of you. 23% say yes, you do. That's actually higher than I thought we would see. So, you know, that's great. Um, and 29% says we're planning to develop one. So that's a good indication that your company's moving in the right direction with the right goal as well. You know, 39%, no, you don't, but you might want to consider this in the future. And 10% need to continue to learn a little bit more about it. But I'm very proud of the 23% of you that do and the 29% of you that are headed in that direction, because I think as you go through this process, you'll absolutely see the value in moving forward with it as well. And then just a few more slides to share with you in this case. Um, as you go through the risk assessments, we've talked about what type of risk assessment that you use. You know, typically it's the likelihood and the severity. You know, in the case of foreign material, where we're doing foreign material control assessments, we always do the failure mode effect analysis. So in that case, in addition to likelihood and severity, we're looking at detectability as well. That ultimately gives us a risk priority number. And then in the end of this process, you can assign a company risk profile and a plant risk profile. And then for each of those 24 key areas, you know, a risk number that's assigned to that as well. And then on the next slide, once you identify those areas of high risk, then now we identify what do we do to mitigate it? So, you know, the beauty of this process is you look at everything as a whole, but once you identify those very high and high risk areas, then you put your attention to that. And this is a perfect example of where the 80-20 rule does apply, that typically 80% of the problems come from 20% of the process steps. And if you focus on those 20% of the process step, you'll wipe out the majority of the problems that you've got. So it just helps you zero in on where the mis risk mitigation is needed the most. So you can identify that for each high area. Again, great opportunity to get your senior leadership involved and in sponsorship and keep them informed. And I really encourage you to just use your food safety management team to regularly meet and oversee these types of processes as well. Okay, and on the next slide, the last one that I'm gonna share with you is just an encouragement to make sure you keep your systems current themselves. You know, Remember we talked about, you can do a four cause reassessment as you have changes. And we talked about the significant changes also, if you have a bad audit, if you have adverse or bad audit findings, internal audits or external audits, you know, is a good time to do those reassessments. You know, path, positive pathogen tests, recalls would definitely, you know, trigger that for you as well. 
And then remember, you know, use your annual review process of the food safety plan, the SQF system review, the SQF internal audit, and the SQF management review. All of those have to be done at least once a year per the code requirements themselves. But again, don't just check the box. Make sure you really challenge these systems to make sure they're working the way they're supposed to. And then for the specific programs like traceability, crisis management, and food defense we talked about to really challenge those systems as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Laura, and I think she's going to share some information with us about how do you break your system, and if you can, how do you fix it? So, Laura, so great to be with you today. Thanks, Jeff. Gosh, um, always an honor to present with you, and what great information. I, I can just see people taking notes um, out there. So thanks so much for all your wisdom there, and um, thanks to the SQF team. Uh, Jonathan and team for having us. So yeah, let's talk about, so we're, we need to ferret out these risks and we need to figure out a way, is our system delivering? We're spending a lot of energy. Jeff, you are listing a lot of those programs. And the, the thought is we're assuming those programs are you know, eliminating or reducing the risk because we have those systems in place. The is that the case? And really that's what we wanna find out in this exercise. So if we go to the next slide, um, the, the one area I think we don't spend as much time on as we should, and that's the employee awareness. Do they have that risk awareness that we need for them to have? And you know, let's face it, we cannot be everywhere. We need those employees who are actually in place 24 seven um, to, to really look out and see a potential risk and do something about it in the moment. And if we don't have that, then we're missing out on this potential um, opportunity to gear those employees up as part of our quality control, quality assurance team, right? So how do you do that? Well, um, you, you ask them, you engage them in the, what would you do if, you know, you saw some, your, uh, empl fellow employees uh, glove drop into our ingredient mixer, what would you do? And you have an engagement where you're asking them to say, well, so I would um, immediately stop the mixer. I would get a supervisor, tell them what happened, bring them over there, explain the situation. Or, you know, if you get some shrugs or I don't know, then then we've got some some work to do because they just simply haven't um, accepted that risk awareness. So we need that knowledge first of where the risks are and then the ability and confidence to raise their hand and do that escalation. Um, I was in a poultry plant very similar to the one here and I was sitting there watching the carcasses go by and saw blood on the carcasses, multiple carcasses. And I was, nobody was saying anything, nobody was doing anything. And I finally said, what, what's going on with the, these carcasses? And what had happened is uh, an employee had cut themselves. It was so cold in the room, didn't even realize it. And, and that was getting transferred on the carcasses. And, and so these things happen and, and we have to be able to say, you know, get those employees, even if it's not them that did it, but they see something, they need to say something, right? Um, you can do this in pulse surveys too. You know, uh, hey, I, I, you know, you can give an employee a, a question. Do you have the authority to stop if you see a potential um, risk, product risk, and alert the supervisor? Yes or no? Simple ask. And that starts to tell you, have you been able to get that risk awareness uh, conveyed over to those employees? You know, role playing some near misses. Hey, we had uh, some product staged, um, some ingredients staged, and we realized we pulled the wrong ingredient and it had an allergen, whereas we were pro um, producing some that didn't. Wow, we saw it, we found it, but what could we do to prevent that from happening in the future, right? And just some of those, um, you know, uh, engagements and problem solving with those employees. Let's face it, they know where the problems are. They know, they see things. And so they can help solve some of these, these problems and prevent us 
from you know a, a potential hazard. And then doing a deep dive with your risk prevention team. So your HACCP teams, your environmental monitoring teams, you know, we need to engage those folks on a periodic basis. You know, how are we handling the risk on ingredient A? Tell us, tell us what are, what are those hurdles? What are we critical control points that we're that's addressing those? Um, you know, maybe we do a mock recall based on something we're seeing in the news. Uh, um, Jeff mentioned some some wood in some product or some foreign material. You know, gosh, that is happening more and more often. How? How, what if it happens here? Is it is there a possibility it happening in our plant? And what can we do to prevent that? Do we have preventions in place? And so you you make sure that those teams, you know, um, Jeff also talked about construction. Well, does the environmental monitoring, how are they, how's that team responding to that? Are they doing more swabs to make sure that that dust is not contributing to a problem? And in all of these things we're realizing it's very dynamic. Things are happening every day, different, new changes all the time. And we have to take into account our programs and make sure that um, the cha they're challenged and are addressing those challenges. We go to the next slide. So vendors. So vendors are a part of our risk uh, assessments. And typically we have vendors sort of coming in and out of our plants. They're on autopilot, let's face it. Um, we don't really pay much attention to it. We're getting the, we're paying their bill. Um, we see their report, you know, as they leave, but most of the time we're not giving them the true due. And so they should be part of this risk review and test. And so um, what I've seen several folks do is really engage in those vendors. So if you take a pest control operator and you say, hey, I want to have a chat with you. If you could change anything in our plan to address, you know, any potential risk you see, what would it be? And the charm of that question is that they're seeing not just your plant, but they're seeing 70 plants a month, right? And they they know where the best practices are. They know what's what's working and what's not. And how great would it be for them to go, yeah, gosh, there's a there's a fly control method that um, so-and-so is using that's really effective and it's brand new, brand new technology. How great, right, to hear more about that. Or, um, you know what, um, it's, it's your employees are leaving that, that door um, open and it's, it's creating some issues. Just that kind of feedback could be on their report month after month but you might be able to focus on it with, with an example or, or an exercise like this. And looking at those trend reports, um, you know, it's something to get the results um, on a monthly basis, but the trend reports we need to spend more time on. If the farmer next door is, is um, plowing his fields and all of a sudden we get a ton of mice coming in, wouldn't it be great if we had some communications between that farmer and ourselves so we could build up more hurdles in in anticipation of those events that's how we build in a little bit more um, redundancy in our programs to help prevent issues and then of course uh, my favorite when you find this card making sure those those vendors are you know the the pest control uh, folks are going through and executing their job consistently we go to the next slide so what about our programs? Jeff mentioned program. What are the risks in the programs? And I've taken the food defense vulnerability assessments as, as an example of something we can look at. So doing that breach exercise that Jeff talked about and, you know, can anybody get in and, and where in the plant, how far can they go? Who, who actually says, whoa, wait a minute, who are you? And then by the way, let's celebrate whoever that was. Um, and, and um, use that as a teaching moment. <clears throat> um, taking a look at the card access systems review. So I'm not talking about, do we have a card access system? Yes, we have require employees to use a card to get in. I'm talking about, let's look at the data and seeing, do we have a, a creative card that's being used five times in a row because maybe their, their buddies forgot their cards, right? 
So are we getting any misuse in cards? Are we, um, are, are people not even using the cards? You know, there's periods of time where somebody's got some doors propped open and nobody's going through that, that, that particular area. Um, those kinds of things, um, camera systems do what, what are we doing with our camera systems? So yes, we have cameras, but are they all effective? And I can tell you that, you know, a lot of these camera systems, you know, the NVRs are, if you have a 16 channel camera, they're probably re, you know, um, repeating every seven days, for example. So you're, if you haven't gone back and reviewed that data, then you need to know, oh, gee, you know, we need to either review it before the seven days or it's wiped clean. And so understanding how those systems work and that the cameras are effective and are, are, are on online. Um, so lots to do there. And I think, you know, again, it's not, do we have these systems or do we have this program in place, but is it effective? And what's that data telling us? Go to the next slide. We also look at um, plant risk and Jeff did a really good job at this. So I won't spend a lot of time on that, but you know, storage conditions. So we have maybe external storage. I think here in Texas, I can tell you that several plant food plants here um, have had to up their game because some of the product that they put in those external storage uh, uh, trailers have been 110, 120, 130 degrees over the course of several months now. And so the quality of the products degraded, but maybe the there's a different risk associated with that from a from a microbial standpoint. So given that maybe there's some different things we need to be testing um, more often or more frequent, maybe we need to change the storage conditions, et cetera. So really being um, appropriate to um, the, the conditions that exist and taking advantage of those. Um, I don't know where our slides went there. Um, so thank you. Um, so, um, also product flow and, and storage and, I don't know why, for example, um, our sanitation rooms are the dirtiest rooms in the plant. I, it's a pet peeve of mine, not gonna go on there, but um, you know, the very place that should have those clean mops that's you know gonna, gonna clean our areas, are they cross contaminating because they've been sitting there in, in dirty um, contaminated water overnight and et cetera. So, where are those potential risks being in, reintroduced? Um, seasonal impacts. So do we have seasonal impacts where, you know, all of a sudden it's our busy time, we're going to get these new employees in. Where are we putting those new employees to deal with? And and are, let's make sure we're not putting them in a high risk area. And if they are, are they fully trained? And so some of those tests of that. Um, and um, in the plant, so, you know, maintenance, if we look at just a simple thing as lights, I can remember going into a plant and going into the maintenance and having a discussion with the maintenance director. And he said, I said, I'd like to see the uh, unbreakable lights. Uh, and he said, oh, we don't have those anymore, Laura. And uh, here's what we use. And I said, well, why don't you have those? And he said, um, well, we had to have some cost cutting. They said we had to cut, cut our budget by 30%. And those are super expensive. And so we had to drop those out and replace those with these. And I said, well, what happens when a forklift breaks these, these lights? And he said, oh, man, is it a mess. Glass shards go everywhere. We're finding glass shards for all over the plant for months afterwards. It's a big mess. Well, that QA manager had no idea that they would, that change had been made, but yet here's an employee trying to do what's being asked of them. So we have to test what we think is happening out in the plant. Is it in fact really happening? And that's what this whole test events are. You go to the next slide, process risk. So, you know, process risk, uh, again, Jeff, you covered a lot of this, you know, what testing protocols are we using? 
if we're validating what our suppliers are sending us, are we both using the appropriate test protocols or, or comparable test protocols? What are those detection limits and are those the same? Um, are we using is a 17025 approved accredited laboratory to execute on these things? Um, has the methodology changed? Does it need to change? All these questions, and, and that's where you start involving, you know, your laboratory personnel, um, your suppliers. So this is not a, you know, one person does, you know, has these kinds of conversations. This is a team of people. Jeff, you mentioned that getting those teams of experts, and it could be internal and external vendors and suppliers, et cetera. So, um, you know, information technology, cybersecurity, gosh, you know, we have so much automation in our plants nowadays, and lots and lots of, of offlines and Bluetooth and all kinds of things. Well, what kind of, um, you know, security is that exposing us to or insecurity? You know, have we have we been able to test that? Do we need somebody to help us look at where the exposures might be there? Because um, we have we have examples of of whole food plants being shut down, and a uh, um, very expensive uh, lessons learned there. We go to the next slide. So a unique situation. So with unique situations again, um, it could be weather events. You know. I mentioned the the heat wave we're experiencing here in Texas. It could be the snowmageddon. What's that doing for with our plants and our facilities and external storages? And can you know can we still get product when we need? Do we have some redundancies situated? We have exposure in roof leaks or other issues with the floors or walls or ceilings. So all of those things can impact. And what a great way when you're experiencing those is to look at where are the where are the stressors and then let that fill your your um, list of to do's on saying okay we we need a little bit more work here with our our condition of our uh, roof or we need to address maybe our um, stability in our electrical systems etc all right let's go on to our next section here and then once we've uncovered all of these vulnerabilities, uncovered some of these, you know, potential risks, then how are we going to fix them? Well, if you go to the next slide, we're going to potentially reassess some programs. Maybe we thought we had some things in place and maybe we need to add some, some different things. We might need to enhance or in, uh, increase monitoring or verifications. Um, we might need to look at our record keeping a little bit more and let's make sure that our record keeping is accurate um, and that people know how to fill out the forms, that they're the correct forms and, and that we're tracking the documents that are current. Um, we need to make sure that our QA, QC, food safety teams, HACCP teams, environmental monitoring teams, culture teams, all of them are trained. We need to make sure that they have a level of of knowledge that they can help us address. They're here to help us reduce or eliminate risk in our plants. We need to make sure that they have a level of knowledge that is allowing them to do that. And then challenge your systems again. We got the final slide here. Um, it's putting it back together, right? So um, we, all this information that we've got, we've got a document in a, in a um, good way that we're able to distribute it out for corrective actions. Some of it may be uh, for maintenance, for work repair. Some of it may need to be the HACCP teams, it might be employees, uh, might be training HR. So all of these will have a, a different place to go, but we have to make sure it's all documented. We could be engaging suppliers, uh, probably should. If we see some inconsistencies in performance, um, may need to update programs, and again, um, we can't, there could be a lot of information. You're probably saying, Laura, gee, there's going to be a lot of information uncovered here. Yes, but he, but there's no better time to put in an area than to identify potential risks before they're a problem. And so don't hesitate to do it again. Next slide. 
Finally, I think communicating to the company about this effort and about risk assessment, um, specifically the event, um, but also risk in general. This is a perfect time to have a great summary report. Go to that senior le leadership. You're probably going to need some resources. You're probably going to need to under let, do some education on why this is an issue. What, what would this um, not resolving this what could it do for the company and what adverse reactions could happen? So um, definitely a very concise summary report to the senior leader. Could be you need to go to individuals that you uncovered to address some changes. Definitely action items going to your, your risk teams, HASA, risk management ops, et cetera. Update the employees. There's going to be some employees that really shown um, their knowledge and confidence through this thing. Recognize those folks and um, and and really uh, underscore the to others how important that risk awareness is from all employees. Track your improvements um, and and definitely give that recognition. So with that, um, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. We've got uh, more information on this whole using your data, which is so critical. Thank you so much, Lauren, all the great information you shared as well. I'm never going to forget the term, the charm of the question. I love that. So, you know, and, and you do such a great job, you know, getting people engaged and asking those right open-ended questions to help promote the culture and all. So, but the charm of the question, I'm going to remember that one for sure. So good job. Okay. Um, we have two last sections. I'm going to go through them real fast just so we can get to your questions because I think that's most important for us. This section just talks about using your data because, you know, beyond the people side, we people are important and your food safety culture is important. You know, we should be measuring our food safety and quality management systems by the numbers. And as you can see on the next slide, the SQF code itself requires you to define objectives for your food safety and quality management system. And so many companies overlook that and they struggle when they think, what are the real objectives? And then they think, well, we measure a customer complaint, but there's so much more than that. So just, you know, straight up in the policy statement and the code where it requires you to define what are the objectives, you know, I've given you a list of different types of objectives on the right-hand side of the slide. Maybe the easy ones, you know, starting out, we don't want to have a product recall or a foodborne illness, but then, you know, get to the meat on the bone where you talk about what are your internal and external audit results and complaints and GMP compliance and spec compliance, all of those areas that you see there and the ones on the bottom that relate to your food safety culture in terms of training percent completion and turnover and absenteeism rate and how many times are your employees really suggesting things for you. But, you know, pick out which of those are most effective for your system and define what are going to be the right KPIs or one of the new buzzwords is OKRs. What are the, you know, objectives and key results through this process? And then once you define what it is, then, you know, set an achievable stretch goal that, you know, you want to make sure that you can achieve it, but you need to stretch to be able to reach it as well and continuously improve your processes and then define how often are you going to measure it? And then who are we going to report the results and who is it going to go to? But make sure we're managing our SQF systems with the definition of the right objectives for those systems as well. And then on the next slide, it talks about how do you track that information and how do you really use it? So, you know, you want to report the results on a regular basis, just depending upon the type of objective, I would think at least quarterly, but some may be weekly or monthly as well. But what I'd really encourage you to do is use that data as inputs to your system. So when your SQF practitioner has to meet with a management team on a monthly basis, and when you have to do your SQF management reviews that have to be done at least annually, but I would hope you'd be doing them quarterly as a best practice, but use all that data as input. So manage your system by the numbers. And then based on that, you can determine the action items and the outputs about if you're not meeting the criteria, what action do you need to take to be able to achieve the goal? Or how do you continuously improve to go to the next level of the stretch goal as well? And then trend those results on a regular basis, but really make the most of your SQF management reviews and using that data as well. And then on the next slide, we talk about encouraging companies 
to use food safety and quality management system software. You know, as a, I was an auditor for over 10 years and, you know, the thing I always hated the most is you walk into a brand new audit and there's, you know, a dozen plus manuals on top of the conference tables and boxes of records in the corners and such an antiquated way to manage your food safety and quality systems, which are such a critical part of your operation. So just like you have ERP software, master sanitation schedule software, preventative maintenance software, try to use the software for your food safety and quality management systems as well. So easy to convert your paper records to electronic records, which are great because that'll help you track the results. It also gives corrective action alerts. So if you fail to meet your limit, it's going to initiate those corrective actions immediately and it can help you measure your supply chain as well. But I always love the saying, you know, you treasure what you measure. So make sure you're identifying the right things to measure and you're treasuring that data and improving that as well. And then moving on to the next slide, the last thing that I wanted to share with you is just the benefit of having an outside, outside set of eyes to look at things that, you know, we all, if we're in the same environment, look at the same thing every day, you know, the saying is you can't see the forest for the trees. And sometimes by bringing in a set of outside eyes, it helps you to be able to do that. So on the next slide, it talks about starting with your peers and keep in mind that your internal audits must be performed by auditors that are independent of the area being audited audit it to be able to avoid a conflict of interest. So even if it's having a, a packaging supervisor audit a manufacturing department and vice versa, you know, you, and you can switch those departments up different times, uh, but always a different perspective and a different set of eyes always helps look at things a little bit differently. So, um, and if you have multiple plants, you can always switch people between plants. So I was teaching an internal auditor workshop last week in a company that was on it talked about they would actually switch personnel from one plant to the other plant to go do audits periodically. And that's a great way to be able to do that as well. And of course, you can always use a corporate office as well. And then on the next slide, it talks about, you know, third party consultants, just like Alchemy Consulting and others. There's a lot of great people out there that can help you. Typically, what we see with our clients is if they just don't have time to do it themselves, which is the most often case. Or if they don't have the expertise to do it, you know, that's a great time to bring in a consultant to make sure that it gets done and that it gets done accurately and on time as well. You know, again, it's helpful to have the outside eyes and expertise of the consultants that have seen the best practices throughout the industry as well to help you develop uh, robust systems itself. And then remember, the goal is to create a system that's not just compliant but also one that's manageable as well, that you don't want to make your systems overly complex to where it becomes difficult to manage and you increase your chance of noncompliance. So keep both of those objectives in mind. And then just some examples of the best times to use consultants or others or, you know, when you develop new programs, when you're actually doing your annual reassessments, we work with many clients to help them with their SQF internal audits. And we actually facilitate those challenges of their food defense plan and crisis management plan during that process as well. So that's a great time, even being with you during your SQF audit to be a liaison between the auditor and between the company as well. And then of course, for regulatory inspections, getting ready for them or when you're going through them also would be another good time to do it. And then last, you know, think about the third party audits and what type of audits are really gonna use that are gonna be beneficial to your systems as well. Make sure you do use some kind of benchmark standard that just like SQF and the GFSI benchmarking that it's set up against as well. But make sure you have a, a standard audit criteria that you're going to use that's going to be effective. Make sure you're using qualified and trained auditors internally or externally to perform that. And then decide, you know, which type of audits are most beneficial for your operation. So, you know, you may have to do the SQF audit to meet a customer expectation. Uh, and that's great. But, you know, could you also benefit from having a GMP audit or one of the other types of third party audits done that we talked about as well? And then, of course, based on all the audits, you know, look at the results, trend the performance itself, see what kind of nonconformities are identified and the corrective actions for those and make sure you follow the corrective actions through until you complete it and make your systems even better. And with that, on the next slide, just Resources real fast, um, you know, just at Alchemy Consulting. Uh, well, the SQF risk management first, uh, as you saw at the beginning of the slides that we had here, you know, SQF has a wonderful collection of risk management courses that are available on our ZOSI training platform. So you can see those and would certainly encourage everyone to take those courses as well. 
And then next uh, for Alchemy Consulting, you know, we're certainly always here to help you as well. Anything that you need for your food safety and quality management system, food safety culture, even workplace safety, you know, we're here to help you throughout that process. And then last, of course, the Alchemy training platform it has a great training platform, includes all the content you need for your food safety and workplace safety training that you can customize and a great way to deliver that training, manage those training records electronically as well. And then, of course, our coach and our playbook mobile tablet applications that help you verify the effectiveness of your training and digitize your SOPs as well. And with that, Jonathan, we'll go back to you. I'm sorry we tried to keep it moving, but certainly the questions are important and we're happy to hang with you as long as you'd like. So. Great, great, great. Wow. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information in a short amount of time. I hope everyone took copious notes because there was so much good insights in that. But if not, the webinar is recorded. You can revisit it. So uh, time for Q&A. All right. We have a couple that have come in. All right. So first off, how often should we hold a mock drill, audit, recall, etc.? Um, I'll take that and Laura, if you want to add to it as well, um, you know, certainly within the SQF code, it's going to define the frequency of how often that needs to be done at a minimum basis, you know, in, in certain cases like your mock recall and your traceability exercises, along with the food defense and the crisis management test have to be done at least annually. Um, but, you know, you may want to do it more often than that, you know, certainly nothing wrong with doing it more often. Or if you do a test and you get an unacceptable result, remember, you want to repeat that test and improve your systems until you get an acceptable result as well. So in almost all cases, at least annually, but if you choose to do it more often, that's even better for you. But Laura, feel free to hop in. Same, Jeff. You covered it. Okay. Excellent. Uh, next question. What best practices do you recommend for corporate decision makers, engineers, food safety managers, outside consultants, et cetera, to vet their risk-reducing strategies against the goals at the plant level? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> or you want to go first or I'll, I will either go way. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so that's a great question. You know, we always want to make sure your corporate office is connected with your plant location. And oftentimes, you know, you can see a disconnect that, you know, corporate thinks we're doing it this way or they set an objective up here and at the plant. This is how it really happens. And you really don't want a situation like that. So, you know, there's times when a corporate office can set an objective and then the plant may set a different objective or fail to meet the corporate objective. You know, it really comes back to communications and teamwork between those two, but, you know, I really encourage you to work together towards a common goal and, and towards a common area to be able to meet that. So make sure that you're actually working together to the achievement of the same goal that you have. And, and I know that's a challenge, but it really goes back to communication and teamwork. And Laura, I'm sure you can add to that if you want. <laughs> Jeff, I was going to just celebrate the fact that that question was asked. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. You know, from a from a corporate standpoint, what what I think is is all about communication. You mentioned it, and um, what are the risks that the plant is really focused on? And then, you, what you don't want to do is have the the plant thinking that they're hamstrung because they only have this many resources. So this is where we're focused. You know, the charm of the the corporate coming in is they probably have other plants. I would assume that have some some other, you know, that they're familiar with the risk of those other plants. And so there's a role for bringing all of that knowledge together. And maybe there's some, some potential risks that haven't been uncovered yet or uh, is emerging. We've talked about how dynamic, uh, you know, the weather and the ingredients and supply chain. Employees, our plants are very dynamic. And so having this ongoing discussion about risk and emerging risk and where, where should our focus be currently? I think from a corporate standpoint and a plan standpoint, that's a very positive conversation. So I think first is asking the plan, what are, what are we doing now? And then from a corporate standpoint, have we thought of this or that, that other um, sister plants are dealing with? And then that starts a, a bigger dialogue. So that's how I would work. 
Great. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. So uh, we have, what about the action items? Is it enough just to show the action item and the follow-up? I think that might be a contextual question to when one of your guys' presentation. Do you recall? I talked about action items coming out as a result of the management reviews. And then if you're looking at the data and the input going into those management reviews, and then you know, typically if you're failing to meet one of your targets, you want to create a set of action items to be able to show, you know, what are you going to do to try to reach that target as well? So, you know, here again, that's a great question, something wonderful to be able to ask as well. Um, and you you definitely need to show the follow through with that. Um, it really depends on what the action item is and which of the SQF programs that it relates to, you know, on a on the highest level and most formal basis, you know, if you're doing an internal audit and you identify non-conformance during that internal audit and you identify a corrective action that needs to be done, keep in mind the cap of procedures within the SQF code requires you to not only implement a corrective action, but also a preventative measure to try to keep that from happening again and requires documentation of the verification of corrective actions as well. So all of that needs to be done. Certainly, I think that would be a best practice for any of those action items. So, you know, show the follow-up that needs to be done, show the corrective action that was taken. If there's a preventative measure necessary, go ahead and include that as well. And then do a check back, you know, come back three months later or at a certain point and verify that that process is still under control would be a recommended best action. Nothing to add, Jeff. Very thorough. Thanks. Great. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time that we have today. If we did not get to your questions, please include it in your responses to the post-webinar survey email that you'll receive, and, and we'll follow up with answers. I want to thank everyone who attended this three-part series. It was fantastic. And I especially want to thank Laura and Jeff for their wonderful insights to this very, very important topic. Thank you all. Have a great day.